Good morning, church. It's a great privilege to stand before you to bring the word of life today. And like our pastor said a while ago, I will be teaching from Genesis chapter 42 to 44. Three chapters, 106 verses. I promise you I will not take 106 minutes. All right. All right. Turn your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 42 as we take the first 11 verses. And then I would pray. And I, I will do um, a, narrative, um, a narrative exhortation from the Word of God. And at the end, I'll give you all three key practical applications, and we would pray. Genesis 42, from verse 1 to 11. Now Jacob saw that there was grain in Egypt, and Jacob said to his sons, Why are you staring at one another? And he said, Behold, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us from that place, so that we may live and not die. Then ten brothers of Joseph went down to buy grain from Egypt. But Jacob did not send Joseph's brother Benjamin with his brothers, for he said, I am afraid that I may befall him. Verse 5. So the sons of Israel came to buy grain among those who were coming for the famine was in the land of Canaan also. Now Joseph was the ruler over the land. He was the one who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. When Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them. But he disguised himself to them and spoke to them harshly. And he said to them, Where have you come from? And they said, From the land of Canaan to buy food. But Joseph had recognized his brothers, although they did not recognize him. And Joseph remembered his dreams, which he had about them, and said to them, You are spies. You have come to look at the undefended parts of our land. Then they said to him, No, my Lord, but your servants have come to buy food. We are all sons. We are all honest men, sons of one man. We are honest men. Your servants are not spies. Amen. Let's pray together. Dear Father, we have come before you to learn from your word. I want to thank you for every heart and soul you have brought here. Lord, we ask that you would speak to us clearly. You would help us to understand your will. And by the time we will rise from here, you would help us to respond to your word in appropriate biblical manners. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, our topic today is testing. And um, we will share together uh, from Genesis 42 to 44, like I said. So what is testing? Testing is the act or practice of giving tests to measure someone's knowledge or ability. And it would also be seen as an attempt to reveal a person's capabilities by putting them under strain in challenging situation. And so we would be looking at the word of the Lord today. Who was tested? How was that person or those people tested? I'd like to start by reminding us that in Genesis chapter 15 and verse 13 specifically, God had told Abraham that his descendants would go to a foreign land. In fact, he told him specifically that four generations away from you. And so the story of Joseph laid the foundation for the movement of that old generation to the land the Lord had promised. So our text today builds up to the account leading to that. So to make all of this that God said in Genesis 15 happen, 
Joseph became the prime minister, like um, uh, Elijah taught us last week. So I'd like to start today's message from where he stopped last week. And so permit me to read Genesis 41, uh, because he covered to 41, and then I'll pick up from 42. Genesis 41, from verse 56 to 57. So when the famine had spread over all the land, Joseph opened up all the storehouses and sold food to the Egyptians, for the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. Moreover, all the earth came to Egypt to buy, to Joseph to buy grain before the famine was severe over all the land. Now, if the Bible said all the earth had the experience of the famine and all the world came, I'd like us to bring it to our days. If that had happened all over the world, let's talk about um, channels where the news would be. Um, BBC, right? CNN. Go ahead, tell me. Uh, Al Jazeera, Facebook, right? X, Fox, good. So the news is going to be everywhere. You agree with me, right? You would expect that younger men will hear the news before the elderly. You also agree with me, right? All right. So it's assumed that all the children of Jacob already heard that there was food in Egypt. So you would also agree that it's always the elderly ones, the parents that hear the news last, right? So Jacob had the news. And then he walked up to his kids. And he said, chapter 42, verse 1. Now Jacob saw that there was grain in Egypt, and Jacob said to his sons, Why are you staring at one another? And he said, Behold, I have heard. So the, the children of Jacob were staring at one another. Do you know why? Because in Genesis chapter 37, when they sold their brothers out, they knew the people who bought their brother was taking him to Egypt. They did not know what happened to him. The journey from Canaan to Egypt will take six weeks. So something must have happened to their brother within that journey. They never knew what happened, but immediately they had Egypt, their minds, when stood, oh, Joseph. But they were staring at one another. They decided not to do anything until their father said to Egypt, you guys must go to get food. And so today I will share with us a story of service, slavery, sacrifice, suffering, sincerity, situational response, genuine sorrow, and sympathy. I will try to reveal to us how testing could bring profit if we pass through it and excel. So I would summarize the story. So from chapter 42, verse 1, J Jacob sent his 10 sons. And of course, he decided to keep Benjamin back. Why? Because Benjamin happened to remain the only child from his beloved wife, Rachel. So he sent all of them, and they went on the journey. By the time the brothers got to Egypt, they saw the prime minister who was in charge of disbursement of food, and they bowed down before him. Of course, Joseph recognized them, but they did not recognize him. 22 years had passed. I believe that we are not the same way we looked 22 years ago, right? Some of us look more handsome then, and some of us look more beautiful now than then, you know? You know, so they left him 22 years ago. He was younger then, but now he was a matured man. He was wearing an Egyptian beard. You know, Israelis keep their own beard big. But if you had seen the Egyptians, they are well shaven and, you know, and he was putting on royal clothing. So they bowed to him and they would still bow again and again and again. And so when Joseph saw them, he accused them of spying. And, you know, immediately he accused them of spying. The brothers were trying to impress him. So they said, no, we are 12 brothers. We have one brother at home. One is no more. And... <laughs> You know, if you look at the text we read, I intentionally stopped at verse 11, because that was where they said, we are all sons of one man. We are honest men. Really? 
<laughs> you know, we, you are talking to Joseph and he said, we are honest men. Joseph would have just like, really honest? Not you, <laughs> you know? So he took them and he threw them in jail for three days. They threw him in pits for some hours. He threw them in jail for three days. And you know, there are some times that when people pass through affliction, their mouth starts running. Have you seen that before? Somebody is enjoying all the largesse of life and you think everything is fine. But immediately the corn flips and the person sees devastation. The mouth starts running. He threw them in jail. Then the brother started. Ha! Oh, if we had known, we would not have sold Joseph. And he was there, right in front of him. We would not have sold Joseph. And you know, and one of them said, but the boy was crying that day. We would have just had mercy on him. And Reuben came and said, you better keep your mouth shut. That day I wanted to save him, but you sold. And they were playing out the life of Joseph right in front of Joseph. And their guilt was reawakened. And Joseph was testing his brothers to see if they were changed people. He wanted to be sure that there was no more wickedness in them. You know, most times what we want to do is we want to change people. But we need to know who they are. Joseph had forgotten that it was not only his brothers that was being tested. Today, I will share with you a review from the scriptures that between Genesis chapter 42 and 44, there are three categories of people that were tested. The brothers were tested. Joseph was tested. Their father was tested. And then I will show you how the Lord used testings to groom his children. And so at this point, God was also looking at Joseph to see if there was wickedness in his heart or if he would revenge on his brothers. God was testing Joseph as well to see if he still had it in him to take revenge or pay evil for evil. And so they were tested, but the brothers were tested in multiple folds. So they went to Egypt to transact business, and it has nothing to do with finding Joseph. They were not expecting to find Joseph. The other time when I said 22 years had passed, I like to break it down. Joseph was sold to slavery at age 17. The day he became the prime minister in Egypt, the Bible says he was 30. And that's a difference of 13 years. There were seven years of plenty. 17, uh, 13 plus seven is 20. And there was now two years of famine, 22 years. And so the David they left was, uh, sorry, the Joseph they left was 17. Now he should be about 39 or 40. So they were not expecting to be that. He had passed through the Potiphar's house, prison, seven years of plenty and two years of so, And he was not the man they were expecting. But Joseph wanted to know if he could trust them or if he could trust their words. You know, we are honest men. How do I believe you? I do, how do I trust you? You know, I wanted to give it up to pastors when people come to them to say, write recommendations for me. How do I know you? How do I know what to write? But pastors must write, right? They just must write something. So he needed to know who they are, and so he decided to test them. I'd like you to ask yourself, have you ever been betrayed? Have you ever been lied at? Have you ever been scandalized or maligned? If you have a second chance with such a person, would you let down your guard? Or would you relate with that person with the prior incident in mind? You know, sometimes you just have to try and test such people before you trust them. You know, if that person had stolen from you before, you tell the person, oh, can you go to Walmart for me? And you give the person some money just to be sure if he's going to run away or not. You just want to test the person. Joseph hid his person. And now I want to go into the scriptures a bit. He hid his personality from his brothers just as Jacob did. 
Today, I will show you some things in the lives of, and, and I'm going to be asking parents to pray today. Your children got your DNA, but they also got some of your attitudes, some of your behavior. Now, a, a man said, a man said, he said, my daughter is as beautiful as my wife. She got her beauty from my wife. But anytime she's angry, I see myself in her. You know the meaning of that? He got the, she got the anger from the dad. Now, Joseph hid his personality the same way Jacob did. You remember the day Jacob wanted to steal from the father? He said, I am Esau. And he dressed with animal skin. So it was not, it was not difficult. This is a part of a recurrence of certain traits discovered in their family history. Making up stories is not difficult in that family. Abraham made up story, Genesis chapter 12, from verse 10 to 20. He said, Sarah, when we get into that city, tell them you are my sister, not my wife. I don't want to die. Genesis chapter 26. Isaac told his wife, when we get into that city, tell them you are my sister, not my wife. I don't want to die. And so, it was not difficult for Jacob to make up a story. The ten brothers got home with their brother's shirt. And they said, check out. Is this your son's shirt? An animal must have killed him. Making up stories is not difficult. So, it wasn't difficult for Joseph to say, you are spies. It runs in the blood. So we would be praying to the aspirants that only good things will run through us to our children so that they don't learn to lie or to deceive people from us. That was exactly what happened. Joseph deceived his father and the 10 brothers deceived him. And I'm going to show you someplace in, in chapter 44 where Jacob had to tell his sons why did you have to tell the man the truth that you have a brother? You would have lied. We used to lie. Most times, we just think our children have turned into what they have turned into. We don't remember that they learned some of these things from us. And thank God the children are not here today. So we can tell ourselves the truth and pray. All right. So he made up a story for them and said, y'all are spies. Only that the motive of Joseph was not to deceive. His motive was to discern. And we must learn that. When he made up that story, he did not make an attempt to deceive his brother. It was just to discern their character. So do not forget that Joseph was ascribed as a man in whom there's the Spirit of God. We, we learned that last week. Even Pharaoh said, the Spirit of God is in him. So if the Spirit of God is in him, I'm sure he was not deceiving his brothers. He actually wanted to discern who they are. So God used him to get his brothers to confess their sins and resolve to do the right thing. Do you know, for 22 years, the scriptures did not tell us that the brothers confessed their sin until that day. There was never a time when they said, oh, we did this. Oh, no, it was until when Joseph threw them into jail and then he, after three days, they started saying, oh, we are sorry. We would not have done this to our brother. And so, Genesis chapter 42 from verse 17 to 24 revealed when Joseph brought them out. On the third day, Joseph said to them, do this, verse 18, and you will leave, for I fear God. If you are honest men, remember they told him they were honest, right? If you are honest men, let one of your brothers remain, and you all take food back to your father. Bring your youngest brother to me, verse 20, so that your words will be verified. And that was where the brothers started spilling out their gods, verse 21. Oh, we are guilty concerning our brother. In that, we saw the distress of his soul, and all, and all, and all. They confessed all. And at that point, in verse 24, Joseph turned away from them and wept. He wept at hearing how callous, how wicked his brothers were in dealing with him. Then he came back and he took Simeon and bound him before their eyes. Yeah. 
You know, sometimes we stand and we look at people eyeball to eyeball and we think, I am your karma. I'm going to deal with you. Listen, if God ever place you in a position to deal with people and you treat them well, that is when you are truly a child of God. If you are in a position to deal with people and you treat them harshly and rudely, you have only shown that you are not better than them. And so, at that point, it is left to you to determine the fate of those people. So, he imprisoned them for three days, and they must have struggled, they must have had a lot of things, but it took Simeon hostage. So, on their way home, they found out that their money was still in their bags. Chapter 42 from verse 26 to 28. And look at what they said. God is punishing us. What is this that God has done for us? Today, I want to beg you. I'm going to give us a few minutes to pray. If there's any guilt in your heart, confess it. You see, so many people are bent double today, bearing burdens of guilt. It's not good. Confess your sin to God. And if you are led, remember the scriptures in James, confess your sin one to another. Speak with the pastor. Unbutton your heart. You know what? If you do not do that, every time anything goes wrong, your mind will think it's because of what you did. And that is it. They saw their money and they said, God, we are in trouble. It's just because of our brother. They must have lived for 22 years miserable. All right? And so, they got back home and reported their encounter to their father, and Jacob was distressed. And at that point, Reuben was saying, Daddy, you don't have to worry. If we want to go, I'm going to take Benjamin with me, kill my sons if I don't bring him back. But you know, Jacob is so tired of losing children. He would not buy that store. And so, they got back home, they started eating their food, and the children were looking up to their father to ask them to return, but they never returned until the food got finished again in chapter 43. And the father said, okay, guys, would you return now to get food? And the kid said, no, we are not going anywhere. The man made us promise that we're going to bring our brother. And if we don't go with our brother, he said, he would not allow us to see his face. And that was when the father said, why? Why? Why did you tell him you had a brother? You were not supposed to do that. And he said, no. The Lord of the land, chapter 43, the Lord of the land asked us, chapter 43, verse 7, is your father still alive? Have you another brother? You know, even the 10 brothers were stupid. If somebody is asking you, is your brother alive? Is your father? Something should tell you, this guy knows us. You know? And we told him, and at that point, it was Judah that the Lord used to help Jacob. Judah walked up to Jacob and said, Sir, let us go back on this trip. If you had allowed us to go with Benjamin, we would have returned twice. Release Benjamin to us. We will take him there and we'll bring him back. If for any reason I cannot bring him back, then let the sorrow and the pain be upon me. And at that point, Jacob was broken. And they told them, take gifts for the man. Take your money, return with double. And then look at what he said in verse 14. Chapter 43, verse 14. And may God Almighty grant you compassion in the sight of the man that he may release to you your other brother and Benjamin. As for me, if I am bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. Please listen. Before Jacob got to this point of brokenness, he held onto Benjamin as, I will be the one to take care of you. You must always be before me. Parents, let us learn to yield our children to the Lord. Only the Lord can take care of our children. And that is why some parents find it difficult to allow their children go to college or go to, or get married. 
or become something. We always want to be there. No. It's good to be there, but allow God to take care of your children. Abraham was tested with Isaac. Now, Jacob, the son he loved, had gone. And now he doesn't want to let go of Benjamin. Listen to this, please. Until you let your Benjamin go, your Joseph will not return. And most times we want to hold on to the Benjamin. You know, I will get to that point. I pray time is on my side. Where, why should I pay tithe when the 90% is so, so meager? Let the Benjamin go that the Joseph may return. Let the tithe go that the floodgate of heaven might be open unto you. And so the man got to a point where he said, okay. Okay, okay, take your brother, verse 13, arise and return to the man. Verse 14, may God grant you compassion. And that was when they left and they traveled, they took the presents to Joseph. And when Joseph saw them, he was glad. Chapter 43 from verse 26, he could hardly contain himself so that he told the servant, make a dinner happen and let it be in the noon. And right there again, at the point of eating, Joseph tested his brothers again. You know, the Egyptians sat alone to eat. The servants of Joseph sat alone and they made the brothers to sit down according to their age, you know. So Reuben sat at the farthest. Benjamin sat at the last. Now listen. For every one piece of food they gave to Reuben and the brothers, they gave five to Benjamin. Now imagine the stewards. After they had saved you once, they walked in front of you five times to serve the last one. Joseph wanted to see if animosity, if acrimony, if vile, if bitterness is still in their minds. So he was watching. Let's see what would happen. But the brothers passed the test. Now, it was nothing to them. Because only a piece of robe made them run, they, they ran nuts to the point where they sold Joseph. So let's see what happens if this younger one got more. And eventually, when he saw that nothing like that happened, the Bible says they made merry, they enjoyed themselves, and they went to bed for the night. Chapter 44. So the next morning, Joseph decided to give them the final test. You know, he told the steward, put the money back in their bags, but in the bag of Benjamin, the last born, put my gold cup. You know, when you sit down with royalty and there's a particular cup that looks fine, everybody notices it, right? So he said, that fine cup, put it in his bag. And then they put it in Benjamin's bag and they left. Few minutes later, I told the steward, pursue them and tell them, one of you had stolen my cup, whoever it is that stole my cup would be my servant. So he ran, he met with them. The first thing they said is, no, we are not thieves. If any of us stole that cup, kill the person. Oh, the guy said, no, 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 we are not killing. We don't kill him. You know, these brothers like killing. So we don't kill him today. Whoever has your cup will be my slave. So they turned every bag, every bag, every bag. Then they got to Benjamin and they saw the cup. The first thing that the 11 brothers did was to tear their robe. It became a communal mourning. You know, it's easy ordinarily to say, good. We used to know you used to be a thief. And now, karma has caught up with you. Take him away. But no, they tore their robe and they followed after the servant, all of them. And they fell before Joseph again. And this time around, Joseph was enraged. I treated you well. I did well. Why did you steal my cup? Don't you know it's the cup I used to do divinations? And at that point, he said, the one who has my cup will be my slave. You guys return to your father. You know, 
He wanted to know if they would willingly do away with Benjamin like they willingly did away with him. And so, Judah moved some steps forward, like the Bible said, and Judah made a speech. People of God, please listen. In 15 verses, Judah said the word, my father, 15 times. And he used the word Lord six times. You know, it was like, please, my father cannot do without this boy. My father will die in sorrow. Do not forget, this was the same Judah who told them to sell Joseph without caring for their father. Now, the question is this, what has happened to Judah? I'm going to tell you what happened to him. A few weeks ago, our pastor stood here and taught from Genesis 38. Do you remember? He said, this is a part of the Bible I need to teach, and it was the story of Judah. The Bible started in Genesis 37 with the story of Joseph, and there was an interruption. 38 was the story of Judah. Let's remind ourselves. In Genesis 38, Judah lost two sons. Did you remember that story? Two sons. And he also went out to a prostitute, not knowing that that was even the wife of his first son. And the prostitute had two sons for him. Genesis 38 broke Judah to pieces. Now listen, there are some things we are passing through now, not as though God wants us to pass through it, but we need to be broken. Because he is the potter. We are the clay. It's until the clay is broken that the final vessel can be made out of it. And so, Judah spoke, and a Bible scholar said that was one of the most manliest and most straightforward speeches ever delivered by any man. He spoke out. He became the clearest example of a man who had experienced life and a great change, such that when he was tested, he stood firm. Let's look at the practical applications, three things, and we will pray. Number one, in this story, Genesis 42 to 44, we saw fulfillment. The brothers came and they bowed to Joseph. It took 22 years of waiting, but God doesn't lie. Everybody look at me. Whatever it is that God had told you in his words, whatever, it will come to you. You know, Isaiah, in chapter 55, from verse 10 to 11, he said that the word from the mouth of God will not return back to God. If you have opened the Bible and you have seen a covenant promise and you have held on to it, I'd like to tell you it will come to pass. Don't give up on God. It took 22 years. But it came to pass. So what has the Lord said to you? He will do it. First Thessalonians 5.24. Faithful is he that called. He will do it. The second thing we saw from chapter 22 to 44 is character formation. God does the same with us. Anybody God wants to use in a special way, God shapes their life. He shaped Moses for 40 years. He shaped and fortified Jacob's character by allowing him to experience years of servanthood and humility. God refined Joseph's life through many trials. And now he was speeding up the development of Joseph's brothers so that their character could be developed. My question for you is this. In what way is God attempting to change your heart to prepare you for a more excellent service? Don't run away. Don't run away. Job chapter 23, verse 10. Job chapter 23, verse 10. Job said, and when he has tested me, I shall come out as gold. There is no gold that doesn't pass through fire. I don't know how hot the hoven is now. Please allow the Lord to work on your character. You know, some of us have some terrible things that we are asking God to work on. Some of us petty lies, some of us all of this. Allow the Lord to work on it. Because one day, someday, you could be the governor of the state. 
He could be somebody important. And those character can bring us down. Charisma takes people up, but character brings people down. The third thing we see from chapter 42 to 44 is promotion. Before God puts any man into anything serious, God tests them. Show me a person who became a generational blessing, and I will show you a man who passed the test of Yahweh. God will not use any vessel he has not tested. He tested Job for resilience. He tested Daniel and the three Hebrew boys for their faith. Jesus for obedience, you know? So what are you being tested for? That's the question today. Remember, Proverbs chapter 24, verse 10. Proverbs 24, 10. It says, you are a poor specimen if you fail in the day of adversity. So that which you're passing through now is to bring out the best in you. So we must call to heart that Jesus Christ is the only one who would still treat us with kindness and grant us a new beginning despite all that we have done to him. You know, Joseph saw his brothers and he still tried them, he still tested them. But when we come to Jesus, he opens his arms wide and he brings us in. Jesus will not first of all say, I'll throw you in prison for three days to be sure you really want to be born again. Mm -mm. He's going to save to the uttermost those that come to God through him. He is the one who, though we sin against him and deny him a million times, he will still show us mercy. Remember that Jesus did not repay us for all we did to him while we were sinners. So, if only we will allow him access to our hearts today, if only we will choose to live for him today, if only we will live right and continue and stop nailing him to the cross, if we would remain ever willing, if we will do all that he asks of us, he is ever willing to receive us and save us to the uttermost. And my question is this. Will you not come to Jesus today? Please bow your heads in a minute. I'll be speaking to three categories today. The first is, I want parents to pray that the Lord would help us to leave a legacy that our children can see, learn from, and continue. That we will not fail in parenting. The second is, if you are here, and you have not surrendered your life to Jesus. This is the time. The world we live in is cruel. People are wicked. The only grace we need that can take us through is when we run to Jesus. Would you consider giving your life to Jesus now? And the third is, are you here today? You are a Christian, a child of God, but you can perceive that truly you are passing through a testing period. Can you say, Lord, give me grace, grace to pull through without disappointing you? Everyone that was tested came out with a generational blessing. Yours will not be an exception. I'd like you to pray. Just pray if you want to give your life to Christ. I'd like you to know that as we sing a song of response, I'll be standing here, Elijah will be standing here, our pastor will be at the rear. Feel free to walk up to any of us who would pray for you. Or if there is anything you want us to pray for you about, please feel free to, talk, to, to come. And in a moment after that, we would yield ourselves to partaking of his table. The Lord depends on us. But the first thing here is if you are not born again, you need to do that. Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you for today and thank you for your word. Thank you because... You want the best from us. And we ask that you would help us to come with open hearts to you. I want to pray specially for parents here. That even when we want to correct our kids, even when we want to tell our kids, why are you doing all that you are? That we will remember that they pick their DNA from us. And we should pray and bless them and lead them in the path of righteousness. Is there anyone here who has not given his life or a life to Christ? Father, as we respond in singing, 
let the Holy Spirit convict our hearts and help us to approach you in appropriate biblical ways. We thank you, Lord, and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.